Well, let's, uh, let's turn our attention to God's word, shall we? And, and feast upon this word. Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards, great, greatest theologian probably ever in the Americas. Uh, he regularly prayed this prayer. O oh Lord, stamp eternity on my eyeballs. What a valuable prayer. What a difference it would make in our lives to have this eternal perspective constantly before us. Oh, Lord, stamp eternity on our eyeballs. We need to have heaven and hell constantly set before us because we need to live today in light of forever. In today's text, we're taken to heaven and we're told to set our gaze on the heavenly places. We're in Colossians chapter 3, and we're continuing our study through the book of Colossians, going verse by verse and text by text. This is our last message in the uh, sub-series in Colossians that I've entitled Rooted in Conviction. This is closing out the Rooted in Conviction portion of Colossians. And our last few sermons in Colossians have dealt with exposing false teaching. And that's been necessary for us to give our time and attention to. We often have to to look at what's coming at us that's false and be aware of it and be ready to face it. But it's not much fun to study that. Today is glorious. Today's text is a uh, warm fire after a cold rain. It glows with positive instruction and magnificent theology. And this is perhaps the most well-known passage in Colossians, and for good reason. It is loaded with convictions that we need in order to live this life for Christ. Let's hop right into our text this morning, Colossians 3, 1 to 4, and go ahead and uh, follow along with me as I read our text for this morning. God's word says, Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. For you died, and your life has been hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is manifested, then you also will be manifested with him in glory. Fathers, we come to this text this morning. Open our eyes and set our eyes where they need to be. Set them on things above. May we seek the things above and set our eyes there and may it change how we live this life. Stamp eternity on our eyeballs this morning, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Imagine with me for a moment that your brother or sister just became president of the United States. They were just inaugurated and they just entered the Oval Office. What would that mean for you? How would that change your life? All of a sudden, you'd have some new and powerful privileges. You could waltz into the White House whenever you wanted. I'm sure the security would still stop you and ask you, but you could get in. Uh, You'd be instantly famous. You're the president's sister, president's brother. You'd possibly, if you wanted it, receive a job on their administration and have some say in U.S. policy. When a relative rises to power, you're raised up with them, and the rising tide there raises all boats. That familial connection would change your life. When we enter Colossians 3, we begin to see more clearly what the family connection with Christ means for us as believers. What effect does it have on our lives? We've been told over and over again by Paul that as believers, we're in Christ and that Christ is in us. And this makes a profound impact on our standing in this world and the next one. In Colossians 3, 1 to 4, we're going to encounter two commands, two commands. We can call them priorities, two priorities of Paul, two do this instructions from God to us. And those two commands, those two priorities are sandwiched between two reasons, two truths, two realities that drive us to fulfill these priorities. 
And so we're going to follow our text this morning, and we're going to look at the first reality, then we'll look at the two priorities, and then we'll come to the second reality. And reality number one is something that Paul has already elaborated on in chapter two, but it's worth repeating as Paul does. And reality number one is this. You were raised with Christ. You were raised with Christ. Look at the beginning of verse one there. It says, therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ. Now, if we think back to chapter two, the message there has been this. At the moment of faith in Jesus, you and I died to the elementary principles of this world. We died to everything that this world holds dear. And we were then buried with Christ, verse 12. And then we were raised to new life with Christ. And this is our new reality as believers, that we have died to this world and we've been raised up to new life in Christ. We've experienced, as we called it, the invigorating co-resurrection. And because of this new life, we've been called upon by Paul in chapter 2 to reject that old system and the philosophies of man-centered religion, to put that behind us. These philosophies, they might sound good, they have the appearance of wisdom, but they are really useless in living the Christian life and in stopping the indulgences of the flesh, as verse 23 ends. And we're to put all that away because our old man died, was buried in the tomb with Christ, and was raised to new life in Christ through his resurrection. And so Paul returns us to these thoughts as we enter chapter three. He says, therefore, if you've been raised up with Christ, So, friend, at the outset, I ask you, have you been raised up with Christ? Have you repented of your sin and put your full trust in Jesus Christ and his atoning work on the cross? Is he your Lord? Is he your master? Have you experienced that rebirth? If so, friend, you've been raised up with Christ. You've been forgiven of all your sins and your sinful soul has been cleansed by the washing of regeneration and you've been renewed in the Holy Spirit and your old man is dead and now you are alive in Christ. And friend, this is your spiritual reality. You must believe it in faith that once you were dead in your transgressions and sins, Colossians 2.13, but you are alive today spiritually, raised up with Christ. And remember, this is a past act done by God. It's not something that we're still scrambling around trying to do. God's already done it for you. You've been made alive. You've entered his family. He is your Lord. And just like if your sibling became president and you enjoyed all the personal benefits of that, Christ has been raised and you have been raised up with him. And we enjoy all the personal benefits of our king being raised from the dead and now enthroned. We get all the benefits that come with that. We reap all the rewards of having a relationship with the king of kings. Friends, this is not just new life. This is new life with Christ. New life in Christ. New life for Christ. It changes everything about us. And this resurrection reality, it inspires us to our first priority. Priority number one, friends, we're to pursue the things above. Pursue the things above. Therefore, if, or we could say since now, therefore, since you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. That's our first priority. Keep seeking the things above. You realize that any other search would be inconsistent. A fisherman does not go out to sea to pursue a catch of birds goes for fish. A Christian man hasn't been raised from the dead to pursue the world, but to pursue Christ. Now, a couple of questions arise here. What does it mean to keep seeking? And perhaps more pressing than that, what are the things above referring to specifically? Let's take those in order. What does it mean to keep seeking? Most translations simply put it forward, seek the things above. That's good. The Greek verb is in a a present tense. It's an imperative. It's something we're supposed to be doing right now. It's something we're supposed to be continually doing. And the idea here is that we're supposed to be forming a habit. Seeking the things above is not a one-time act. This is not a gospel coming to saving faith act. This is a continual thing that we're doing. It's a constant one. It should get ingrained into our system. Back in Colossians 2.6, we were instructed, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. It was also a present tense imperative, a continual action. You don't walk just one time, do you? You keep walking in the Lord. 
an ongoing, continual, habitual thing. And so that's the same as this, this seeking. It's a continual, habitual thing. And I like the LSV's translation here, keep seeking. That gives the idea, make this a habit, keep seeking. Let's unpack that meaning of seeking a little bit now. Picture a young couple who wants to buy their first house. They have a goal in mind, and so they're working towards it. They, they save up money for a down payment. They don't buy that new car or go on that vacation. They might even take on an extra job or seek for a promotion at work because they have a goal in mind. They want to be homeowners. Seeking that goal of home ownership becomes their daily habit. Maybe that illustration doesn't work in here as well because it's Bothell and nobody can own a home around here anymore. <laughs> but perhaps some of you in here are getting ready to retire, right? You've got that number in mind for financial security and you're, you're working to reach it. You're seeking to reach it. And to seek is to strive after something, to aim at reaching a goal. And the point of this word, it's a practical pursuit. It's not only in the realm of concept and theory, it's real. It, it takes effort in the real world. For, if you have the NIV translation, I just want to point this out. They render this verb, set your hearts on the things above. And I just got to say that really misses the point. That's, that's not what the text is getting at. For one, the word heart is not in the Greek. Uh, for second, this is not just a passive emotional desire for the things that go above, but it's a, it's a real, it's an objective, it's a tangible pursuit. It takes action. It takes making changes in your life to reach the goal. That leads us to our second question. What are the things above? Well, this phrase is <laughs> just as nebulous and nondescript in the Greek as it is in the English. The things above, it's an incredibly general statement, like when your wife asks you out for dinner and you respond, food? Right, it's very general. But Paul clarifies a little bit. He adds after it where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God, because it helps. And note the comma after the word is, where Christ is. That, that's good. That is, that's emphasizing Christ's location. That's the whole point. Where is Christ now? Well, he's in heaven, in the throne of God, seated at his right hand. And the emphasis of these phrases is not in what Christ is doing, but, but where Christ is. And the reason for including these phrases, it's to help us get an understanding of what it means by the things above. And so that's a good clue. We're talking about heavenly things, things uh, in glory, where Christ is. If you pop your eyes into verse 2, a further clue comes there where uh, Paul uses the phrase the things above again. This time he juxtaposes it with not the things that are on the earth. So you've got a contrast. The things above that we are to pursue are not earthly things. They're not things related to uh, this present material world. So we're looking at things of heaven, glorious things, not just spiritual things, but heavenly things. Okay, that's great, but we're not in heaven now. <laughs> and I don't know much about heaven. This is kind of hard to pursue, kind of hard to conceptualize. Well, perhaps it is, but hang with me. Let's gather our second priority. It's so integrated, interrelated with the first, we can flesh them out together. Priority number two is to this, ponder the things above. We're to pursue the things above and we're to ponder the things above. Look at verse two for our second priority. It says, set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on the earth. And this second priority for the believer, it regards the mind. In fact, the word mind is built into the Greek verb itself. And so the idea is basically just put it in your mind. Regard, think upon it. The exact same verb is used in Philippians 2, 5. And there Paul says, have this way of thinking in yourself. Same verb, have this way of thinking in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. And there the idea is think this way. The way Jesus thought about humility, that's how you're supposed to think. Set your mind upon that. Put, your, put in your mind the mind of Christ. And here in Colossians 2, we're told to think, to ponder long and hard about this. It's not just an accidental, oh, whenever it pops into my mind, it's a purposeful thinking. It's a choice to think upon it. And so ponder it. Set your mind upon it. Make meditating on these things your habit. Well, what are we supposed to ponder purposely? Verse two again tells us the things above, the things above, not on the things that are on earth. That's what we're supposed to ponder. 
Now, we're going to apply this to our lives in just a moment. We're going to unpack what the things above are a little bit more. But before we do, I want to point something out. This is God's path to sanctification. This is God's path to sanctification, to, to Christ-likeness. If we are rooted in biblical convictions, our pursuits and our minds will be rooted in heavenly things, in the things above, and not in earthly things. You see, the false teachers that Paul took down a few pegs in chapter 2, they promoted a man-centered way of sanctification. Right? False teachers, and let's be honest, even some good Christian teachers who mean well but don't get it at times, promote life change through earthly means. They apply legalism. They apply asceticism. You must do this. You must not do that. And they make that the means of becoming holy and righteous. If you recall our text last week, look again at Colossians 2, 21 to 23. Uh, the earthly method says, do not handle, nor taste, nor touch. These things deal with everything destined to perish with use, which are in accordance with the commands and teachings of men, which are matters having, to be sure, a word of wisdom and self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body, but are of no value against fleshly indulgence. And that last statement is the death knell. Now, let's just take lust, for example. Lust. We know it's out there. It's kind of a taboo topic in the pulpit. I don't hear too many preachers go there, but it's something most every man struggles with. Uh, earthly teaching, even from Christian teachers who mean well, they say this, men, if you're tempted to lust sexually, you need to remove everything from your life that might tempt you to lust. Cut out social media, if that's where it is. Don't watch those kind of movies, the internet, whatever causes you to stubble. Don't handle, don't taste, don't touch. Don't touch that stuff at all. And well, of course, there is some wisdom in removing temptations from yourself. And it is absolutely right to be careful what movies you watch, what internet sites you visit. This don't handle, don't taste, don't touch mentality does not address the heart. It only addresses the circumstance. It may remove temptations to sin and thereby lessen the number of sensual sins, but your heart is unchanged. Your heart is still craving wickedness. And therefore, when an opportunity does arise, you go after that fleshly indulgence. And so these ascetic commands to, to not handle, to not touch earthly things, they don't have any value in actually stopping the indulgence of the flesh. And this is a man-centered, earthly-minded way of conquering sin, thinking that removing temptation is the only thing you need to do to win the battle. Yeah, you probably need to remove temptation from you. It's not wrong. But it's not the only thing. And that's become so prevalent in church today. It's basically the entire Christian counseling system related to habitual sins, whether it's sexual lust, alcohol addiction, anxiety, depression. Just remove the temptations. Remove the triggers for your sinful responses. So that way you stop having those responses. But that totally misses the heart. The Holy Spirit here is offering us a better way. The God-approved, God-designed way to sanctification, to true holiness. Sanctification and holy living is not only about removing temptations from your life. Living a holy life comes from focusing our energy and efforts on reaching for heavenly things, on pursuing and pondering the things above. And starting in Colossians 3, 5 next time, Paul is going to unpack the process of sanctification. He's going to show us how to become truly holy and to live for him. It requires a putting off of sin and a putting on of righteousness in its place. Right now, in preparation for that, Paul is giving us the mindset that we need. If we go into that just with the, the just this road, okay, I'm going to put this off, I'm going to stop doing this, and we miss this mindset, we'll miss the heart. We'll miss the motivation. We must have a heavenly mindset, a heaven-bound mentality. You see, an earthbound mentality, it shackles us here. A heaven-bound mentality releases us to soar there. So let's get practical. Let's get real with this. Let's look at what pursuing and pondering the things above is not and then what it is. What it's not. Pursuing and pondering the things above does not mean we reject the things of earth. It does not mean we stop changing the oil in our car. Love to see you try that doesn't mean ignore doing dishes or washing laundry or buying groceries. It does not mean pulling your kids completely out of sports or never voting again. 
Paul tells the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 4.11, make it your ambition to lead a quiet life and attend to your own business and work with your hands just as we commanded you. There you go, work with your hands, earthly material. There were apparently some people in the Thessalonian church who were so eager for heaven and so eager for the return of Christ that they were forgoing work. They were skipping normal earthly activities and with their head in their clouds, they became lazy on earth. In fact, it seems like Paul's first letter didn't solve this problem, so in his second letter, he addresses it even more clearly. Look at 2 Thessalonians 3, 10 through 12 now. For even when we were with you, we used to command this to you. If anyone is not willing to work, neither let him eat. For we hear that some among you are working in an, uh, walking in an unruly manner, doing no work at all, but acting like busybodies. Now such persons we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ that working with quietness, they eat their own bread. It seems, again, like some people had checked out from normal life while waiting for Christ. But Paul reminds us, we must still engage in this world. We must still put gas in our tank and buy groceries and work a job. These are material things, friends, and we live in this world. But friends, as you know, we are not of it. We are not of it. And so we don't live like this world morally. Paul's instruction here is moral, not material. Pursuing and pondering things above does not mean forsaking material things. So what does it mean? Let's look at it practically. Five ideas for you now. And this is a, um, the application for this is, a, is, is challenging to boil down into something practical. So I, I phoned a friend. Well, I just actually pulled him up on, online. Uh, but a friend of mine, Philip DeCourcy, Pastor Philip DeCourcy, uh, I, I pulled these from a sermon of his, these five applications, because they're so good. And he nails it. And I'm going to encourage you to write these down. They'll be up there on the screen too. Here are five ways to pursue and ponder the things above. First, focus on knowing and becoming like Christ. Think of it. Where's Christ? He's in heaven. He is the perfect representation of all that heaven is. And we were raised with him. We should be thinking about him. His love for us is continuing presence in our life. As near as we might be now in our relationship with him, we can always draw nearer. So prioritize knowing Christ, having a close and personal relationship with him. Ponder all that he is. Christ is a treasure chest full of heavenly gold, and you'll never reach the bottom. So Focus on knowing and becoming like Christ. That's the first way that Uh, pursue and ponder the things above. Secondly, remember that heaven is a real place. Remember, heaven is a real place. And friends, we're going there for forever. What you do right now will still matter 10,000 years from now. Your choices and actions in this life do impact your eternity. Not where you'll spend it if you're in Christ, but how you'll spend eternity. So think upon your eternal life. Think upon your future in heaven. I would encourage you, learn what you can about heaven. Get your mind there as much as you can. Randy Alcorn's book, Heaven's a good, good one to read to learn about heaven. John MacArthur's book, The Glory of Heaven's another good one. Ponder the realities of heaven and pursue a glorious reward in heaven. So remember that heaven's real. It's a real place. Third, practical way, fight the flesh. Don't make peace with the world. Friends, you're no longer a citizen of this world. Heaven's your true home. Let's dwell on that. Let's not get comfortable here. Remember Philippians 3.20. Our citizenship is in heaven, so let's live like it. According to the apostle Peter, you're an alien. (laughs) Not the little green guy. The, The foreign person, right? You're an alien here on planet Earth. You're a stranger. You're just passing through. So this world's ways of doing things, cast them off. Don't get entangled in this world. Don't get comfortable here. Don't settle down here. Don't make peace with this world. Fourth, here's a good one. Meditate on your own death. Yeah, that's a bit morbid. (laughs) But, But do it. Imagine your own cold, dead body lowered into the dirt. Shovels dropping dirt back on top of you. That's the end of all men. And when that happens, what you will do in the body is done. 
You don't want to go to the grave loaded with regrets, so maximize this life. That famous quote, I think C.T. Studd, only one life will soon be passed, only what's done for Christ will last. Meditating on your death prepares you for heaven. It calibrates your pursuits in this life. And friend, just a word to anyone who's suffering this morning, who's full of suffering, putting all your hope in heaven will lift your spirits. Pursuing and pondering the things above will help you through the intense pain that comes in this life. I'm not saying be suicidal, but recognize that one day you will enter heaven and the pains of this life will be over. The trials will be done, so meditate on your death and, as, and let that prepare you mentally from heaven for heaven and let it recalibrate your life while living. Fifthly, lastly, store up your treasures in heaven. Store up your treasures in heaven. Think through the stewardship of your resources, friends, both what you have and what you're doing with what you have. Consider what you do with your resources. How much do you save? How much do you give? What kind of lifestyle do you choose? This is not asceticism. This is thinking through your worldly connections. Friends, know this. Prosperity knits the soul to this world. Okay? It it acts like a tether holding you down here. Wealth can keep your mind and your pursuits earthbound. Just one quick example I thought of. If your money's in the stock market, you'll be caught, and I'm not saying that's wrong, okay, don't hear me say it's wrong. If you're, but if, you're, if all your resources are in the stock market, you'll be constantly watching the stock market. You'll spend your time studying and thinking about it. Your heart will be invested in its ups and downs. But if your resources are in God's work, supporting missionaries, supporting God's church, You'll be staying up to date on that activity. You'll be spending time learning about the work of missionaries and praying for them. You'll be engaged at church where your money is. Your heart will be invested in it and you'll be be looking at its ups and downs. Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, 20 and 21, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Do you want your heart in heaven? Store up your treasures there. Store up your treasures there. Jesus told the rich young ruler how to do that. He said, if you wish to be complete, Matthew 19, 21, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Jesus knows that our hearts follow our money. So friends, invest in heaven, not in earth. If you want to pursue and ponder heaven, put your resources there. So there's five practical ways to pursue and ponder the things above. I'm sure we could think up more if we did a a group think time together. We could ponder up some more. But those are five helpful ways, five essential ways to pursue and ponder the things above. So will you do them? Will you make changes to actively pursue heaven? If you would be holy, if you would be the believer God has called you to be, don't follow the world's scheme for sanctification with its rules and regulations. Instead, embrace God's way. Keep seeking the things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on this earth. If that's your driving ambition, if this is your daily habit, you will overcome the indulgences of the flesh. You will grow in holiness. So those are our priorities, friends. By the power of the Holy Spirit in you, pursue and ponder the things above with everything you've got. Now, I just love Paul. Because we don't really, at this point, don't need any more exhortations to do this, do we? I mean, I think we're all convinced, as believers, as Christians, to do what Paul is saying here. But Paul says, you know what? There's one more incredible truth that changes everything, and I haven't even mentioned it yet. And so before going into the sanctification stuff of Colossians 3, 5, and beyond, I'm going to drop this bomb of awesomeness on you, Colossians. If you weren't convinced to live for Christ already, you will after this. And so Paul drops this bomb. It's a mic drop moment. It's, another, it's a reality for us that's irrefutable, and we must joyfully yield our lives to Christ in light of this. 
And here's reality number two. You are already above with Christ. You are already above with Christ. And if we can get our, if we can mentally get a hold of this, it will change everything day to day. The struggle is to actually believe this, to to grasp it, to hold on to this conviction by faith. So let's try to acquire it this morning if if we're lacking this knowledge or if we know this conviction, grip it tighter than ever. Look at the incredible truths of Colossians 3, 3 to 4 now. It says, for you died and your life has been hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, is manifested, then you also will be manifested with him in glory. The first reason given here is that we have died, died to sin, died to this world, and since we've died, we're called to ponder and pursue the things above. But that's not new information for us. Paul's just putting that in there. It's really the prerequisite for the new information. Having already died, verse 3 says, your life is hidden with Christ in God. Here's the marvelous reality that changes everything. Your life right now is hidden with Christ in God. Now, where is Christ? In heaven. Thank you. Appreciate that. You're right. He's in heaven at God's right hand. So where are you hidden? That's right, in heaven. At God's right hand. Dear believer, if you, uh, if you have believed, if you've repented of your sins and put your trust in Christ Jesus as Lord, you are already in heaven. In some spiritual way, you're already in heaven above with Christ. And I'm not blowing smoke. This is what the Bible says. It's even more clear in Ephesians 2, 4 to 6. Look at this. Ephesians 2, 4 to 6 says, But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and he raised us up with him, and notice, and he seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. All at the same time. From the moment you've been resurrected, you've actually been seated in the heavenlies. Right now, you're in heaven. Now, obviously, we're physically here on earth. You're sitting in these comfortable chairs. You're looking out these beautiful windows at God's wonderful green earth, right? But spiritually speaking, you're already there. What this means precisely, I can't say. (laughs) Wish I could. Commentators weren't exactly helpful either. Perhaps in the same sense that we were truly buried with Christ in the grave, right? We weren't actually in the tomb with him 2,000 years ago, but we were truly buried with him. Perhaps in that way, we're truly with him in heaven. Perhaps it's simply that our names are in the book of life, which is certainly in heaven, and therefore we're hidden in heaven in that sense. I do think it's more than that. I believe there's a literal spiritual sense in which we are in heaven with Jesus right now. But I I can't quite get my mind around it because I'm so stuck in this material world. However we conceptualize it, it's certainly true. That's why Paul can say so boldly in Philippians 3.20, our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, friends, we cannot see spiritual things, can we? We can't see our own spirit. We can't right now see Jesus, though we know he's with us. We cannot see God, though we know he's with us. And in one sense, that's what hidden refers to in Colossians 3.3, that we can't see or touch any of these realities he's talking about. God, Christ, our own spirit, all these realities are hidden from view. And to hide something, in this sense, is to conceal it, right? To to stow it away. I could climb into this pulpit right now and I'd be hidden. I don't think I'd fit. Where's Oliver? Uh, This hiding, it began at the moment of regeneration, the, the moment of salvation, and it continues even today. We've been hid in Christ and we're now and forever hid in Christ. And there is certainly an element of security that comes with this truth. Because you're hidden in Christ, no enemy can get to you. No opponent, no devil, no demons can reach you there. They cannot pry you free from God's grasp through false teaching. They cannot loosen God's grip on you through accusations and threats, right? Nothing can snatch you out of the Father's hand. Amen. Amen. 
But while this truth is awesome, that's not the main point of this word. It's wrapped into it, but the main point of the word hidden here is concealment. We can't see it. It's not visible to us. Right? And, and, and it's not visible to us. It's also not visible to the world either. The, the world has no idea who, who we as Christians truly are. We're, we're like the woman who lives a humble life despite having $100 million in her bank account. But someone looks at her, driving a normal car, living in a normal house, wearing normal clothes, and they just think she's a normal American woman. But in reality, she's filthy rich. She could buy whatever she wanted. And that's the Christian. We're sons and daughters of God with all the rights and privileges that come with it. But nobody outside knows it. They just see us as poor religious folk who are a bit too uptight about things. <laughs> First John 3, 1 explains, See how great a love the Father has given to us, that we would be called children of God. And we are. And for this reason, the world does not know us because it did not know him. And nobody in this world it can possibly grasp that we're citizens of another kingdom. We just look like average human beings to them, but friends, we are aliens. We are strangers, sojourners here. Heaven is our home. And in some very real sense, friends, we already live there. We already live there. And one day, get this, one day, everyone's going to know it. Amen. Everyone's going to know it. Look at verse 4. When Christ, who is our life, is manifested, then you will also be manifested with him in glory. Come, Lord Jesus. Right? When, when he returns and is revealed and he is manifested, we will all see Christ for who he is. The God of all, the ruler of all, the judge of all, and the people of this world will fall down trembling before him as their judge. Yes, they'll give him glory, but they'll be terrified. But believers will rise up in rejoicing, for our Savior has come. And when he returns, Paul explains, then you also will be manifested with him in glory. You see, the spiritual reality of our current life in heaven with Christ that's now hidden, one day it'll be revealed. When Christ is manifested, we'll be manifested. And who we already are, citizens of heaven, this will be revealed to everyone. And what is now spiritual and intangible will then be real. And our physical reality will match our spiritual reality. Philippians 3.20 that we just quoted continues, Our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly await for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by his working through which he is able to even subject all things to himself. Friends, there comes a day, very soon I hope, that what is hidden will be revealed. We look forward to that day. 1 John 3, 1, we also quoted that a second ago. If we just keep going, it says the same thing. See how great a love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And we are. For this reason, the world does not know us but it, because it did not know him. Beloved, now that we are children of God and it has not been manifested as yet what we will be, we know that when he is manifested, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. We look forward to this return. It is the day of our redemption as well. But take note, everything we are now and everything we will be then is directly connected to Jesus. What has Paul been getting at in this letter? Jesus. We proclaim Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Look at verse 4. It says it so simply, when Christ, who is our life, Friend, if you are in Christ, Christ is your life. And right now your life is hidden with him in God and he has raised us to new life and he is going to be our eternal life. Every hope of future glory that we have is wrapped up in Christ. Colossians 1.27 says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Philippians 1.21, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Look at this great verse in Galatians. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. What a text. Friends, Christ is our life, now and forever. So let's worship him. Let's live for him. Let's pursue him. Let's ponder him. Everything is and was and will be Christ. And that's why Christ can say, 
I am the way, the truth, and what? The life. So do you know Christ? If you don't, you need to. You're really missing out. Surrender yourself to him. Confess your sinfulness and believe that he took your punishment upon that cross. Give yourself to him, friend. If you do know Christ already, live for him. Live for him. He is the source of your life. Let him be the source of your values, the source of your outlook on life, the source of your service, the source of everything you are. Friend, the reality is hidden. Man cannot see it. I cannot see it. Only God can see what's real in you. When the king of glory returns and his glory is revealed in us, it will be hidden no more. What we are, children of God, citizens of heaven, will be revealed to all. What a glorious day that will be. So friend, I implore you, and I implore myself, live in light of that day. Live in light of these realities that you are already in heaven above with Christ. Yeah, perhaps the exact meaning of that escapes us, but the fact remains, you're already there. You're already there, so live like it today. Live on earth as a citizen of heaven. That is God's design for you to be holy. So with every ounce of your being, actively pursue and purposely ponder the things above. Most of all, focus on knowing and becoming like Christ. And also, remember heaven's a real place. Fight the flesh. Don't make, don't make peace with this world. Meditate on your own death and store up your treasures in heaven. There was once an entrepreneur on the TV show Shark Tank that everyone felt sorry for. He was trying to convince one of the sharks to invest in his product, a a warm, cozy kind of pullover for men, and nobody was really interested, and he didn't get any offers from the sharks. You guys know the show Shark Tank? Okay, most of you do, right? Somebody tries to, an entrepreneur tries to sell something to these investors. But the, sad, the, the real sad part of this was uh, his backstory that was shared on the show. This man had studied law, and shortly after graduating, he was asked by an acquaintance to draft up some legal documents for a, a new sports business that this guy was trying to get going. So this young lawyer agreed for a small fee, and he did the job. However, this man starting the company was barely making ends meet, and he was investing all of his extra cash back into the company. So he offered uh, this young lawyer uh, to, to be paid in stocks instead of in cash. And, and the man thought about it, but he, 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 he really needed the cash right now. And recognizing this is a brand new company, it could go belly up, there's no promise those stocks ever be worth anything, he took the cash. But turns out that acquaintance was Kevin Plank, and he had just started Under Armour. One of the guys on Shark Tank asked the man, how much would those stocks be worth today? His reply, $250 million. Could you imagine waking up every day knowing you left $250 million on the table? (laughs) Guy must have needed some therapy. And there he was on Shark Tank, still trying to be successful and still failing. He blew a quarter million dollars. Let's be be, uh, fair to this guy. He didn't know the future. He did not know the future. But friends... We do. We do know the future. We know that heaven is coming. We know what is going to be revealed. And in a very real sense, you are already in heaven with Christ. So do you believe it? And will you make every decision in this life in light of that? You are rich in Christ. Don't blow it. You know the future. And when Christ returns, you'll receive something far greater than a quarter billion dollars. Are you rooted in these convictions? Friends, grab hold of Christ, who is your life. You've been raised up with him, and you're ready in heaven with him. So, with every fiber of your being, seek the things above where Christ is. Set your mind on things above, not on things on this earth. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, thank you for your word So many truths in there. So many instructions for how to live for you. We love it. We love your holiness. May that be our greatest pursuit. Lord, stamp eternity on our eyeballs. 
give us thoughts of what is to come. Help us, Lord, to live this life in light of the next. If there be any here who do not know their eternal state, Lord, may that not be that way later today. God, may they run to you, confess their sins, and find hope and salvation in you. Thank you, Lord, for saving us. For us who have believed, for giving us eternal life, for raising us and seating us with you in the heavenly places. Let us live every day in light of that. In Jesus' name, amen.